Resilience is the ability to positively adapt to adversity, trauma, stress, and change. In a previous episode of Qigong Today, we discussed physical exercise through the practice of Qigong and Tai Chi as a fundamental component of resilience. But developing resilience to adapt to life's challenges requires more than regular physical exercise. The exercise must be balanced with rest and recovery. Qigong's slow paced diaphragmatic breathing is an excellent way to accomplish this balance. So what causes imbalance? The main reason is stress. There's good stress. You can build resilience by exercising and working out, but there's bad stress, which is system overload, injury, uh, but most importantly, psychological and behavioral stress. Originally, stress could be caused by humans by some life threat. Uh, we've all heard of the fight or flight response gets activated for self preservation. In modern times, this same nervous system physiological response is due to behavioral initiated stress, even though there's no life threat. So you get increased blood pressure, heart rate, breathing, and metabolism. And this leads to in inflammation and a host of chronic medical issues uh, that result of the stress response is maintained over time. Now, in the early and mid seventies, Dr. Herbert Benson of the Harvard Medical School recognized that this involuntary nervous system response to stress is elevated sympathetic nervous system activity. And he coined the term relaxation response in his 1975 book of the same name, to describe the opposite effect of fight or flight. Invoking the relaxation response causes a reduction in sympathetic nervous system activity. Benson described basic elements of practice for invoking the relaxation response, which are common among ancient contemplative practices. And they include a quiet environment, directing attention to uh, and an object to dwell on, emptying thoughts and distractions from the mind, in a comfortable position. Uh, medical research since the 1970s has greatly advanced our understanding of the psychophysiological mechanisms underlying stress, resilience, and relaxation response. And breathing research and practices are at the forefront. Due to the overwhelming prevalence of stress-related disorders in the general population and the ongoing deficiency of technological and pharmacological tools, to ameliorate these conditions, there's an urgent need for promoting stress-reducing practices such as breathing through Qigong to the public. That's great, Tom. You know, I'm, I'm really thinking about the, the stress response and its connection to resilience. And like you said, there's a connection to good stress. And what I am thinking about is this one research uh, paper that I saw, which is about adapting to stress and how there's a profile associated with people who can adapt to stress. And in particular, I wanted to share the, um, the, the mechanisms for that, that, that happen. And uh, this is an article that occurred in the Journal of Behavioral Medicine whose lead author was Carlos Osorio. And this is a, a really important point here is that stress resilient profile that I mentioned, but also the identifying the neural uh, biological components. And I just really quickly wanted to go through that because it's kind of astonishing what, what that is. And I made a search for the word protection because protection that when you have this profile, it's like you are protected from stress. And uh, what I wanted to point out in particular was these are the, the hormones and neurotransmitters that are part of the profile. So just really quick what this article points what's to. What's the name of the article that you have again? Sorry, it's uh, Adapting to Stress uh, by uh, lead researcher Osorio in Behavioral Medicine uh, Journal. And this was in 2017, I believe, or 2016 here in this print that I got. And so um, the significant uh, neurochemical elements are neuropeptide Y, which is a brain neurotransmitter, DHEA, which some people have heard of, 
and that's a hormone uh, as well. And then galanin, which is an amino acid in the brain that has to do with your brain's ability to make new neurons. So it's neurogenesis. And then allo, A-A-L-L-O, which is allopregnanolone, it's an enzyme that inhibits uh, uh, in, uh, processes that are part of the stress response. And then finally, we have the corticotropin releasing hormone, which is part of the stress marker. So these are all biological markers that indicate the stress response, but also an ability to be resistant to it, to be protected from it. And I love this paper because it starts to point to how we can influence these things. And a lot of that is, like you said, through breathing, through recovery so that, and protecting. So that's really uh, the, the one that I wanted to point out because it points to what you started to talk about, which was slow paced breathing. And it's important to look at this concept of protection too, because we're, we're always thinking about invasive issues in our life, right? Whether they're viruses these days or any kind of toxin or other people even in that kind of stress situation, other people can be a big cause of stress. And it drives us into this autonomic response that we have. But protection, we have to understand this really protecting us on a physiological level and a very deep cellular level, because that's where the damage happens first, right? Wouldn't you guys say it's from what we see in the research, it's the subtle type of damage that takes place at a cellular level that ends up becoming systemic, that takes us out of that homeostatic kind of balance, turns it into emotional responses, but also creates chronic issues at a cellular level that turn out to be symptomatic on very intense levels, which would end up becoming issues we have to deal with medically. So these ideas that you're talking about, Josie, at a protective level are critical early stage protective mechanisms and techniques that we can take advantage of. Yes, and breathing is a big part of how you do that. And the, that's another article that I wanted to share uh, just really quickly that um, I believe it's here, which points to slow-placed breathing and its, it's association with well-being and how that helps to combat uh, the symptoms of COVID-19, which we've heard a lot about, and in particular, this study was, uh, was done uh, with athletes, I believe. So if we talk about this study, it's called Using Slow-Paced Breathing to Foster Endurance, Well-Being, Sleep, co Sleep Quality in Athletes During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And this was in the Frontiers in Psychology Journal, and this was published in 2021. So it's just hot off the press in relationship to COVID. Uh, but this really uh, speaks to that ability to really combat and that protective thing that you were talking about, Francesco, combat and inflammation. And really uh, this has a lot to do with how we breathe because that's really what we're talking about here in terms of the stress response and what is associated in a stress response. Tom, do you wanna to speak to that and the breathing patterns associated with stress? Um, sure. So, uh you have to think about what, how you're breathing when, when you're stressed or, or uh, some condition comes up. Maybe you have, maybe you have a, a, a chronic condition like COPD or, or uh, some other condition. So do you take deep breaths? Do you take short breaths? Are they slow or fast? Do you breathe through the chest or your diaphragm, your nose or your mouth? So, um, so many people take these faster, noisier, larger breaths through the mouth, thinking that that's going to calm them down. But in order to counteract stress and, and build resilience, we need to breathe slowly. So the, the breathing should be, it should be light and it should be slow and it should be deep and a, regardless of the situation. So if you, if you're, you know, scared to death or, or uh, you, you come up, you know, you have an asthma attack or something comes up, and you need to start, you can, you can breathe to get through the situation, but you need to breathe the correct way. And the correct way is not to, you know, take in as much oxygen as you possibly can. There's a really easy way to remember 
what to do. And, and just remember the acronym LSD, <laughs> which is light, slow, deep. And a deep breath uh, is surprisingly that most people think a deep breath is like, you know, breathe as much as you can, but that's the exact opposite of what you want to do. A deep breath is not a big breath. It's expansion and contraction of your lower two ribs. So if you were to start breathing and you, you just slowly put your hands down around your, your uh, bottom ribs there and breathe in and, and slowly breathe out, you can feel your ribs going in and out. And that's the type of breathing that we want in, in all those situations where you are uh, feeling the, the effects of stress. Yeah, there's a ratio. There's a ratio that we talk about and that, that actually uh, researchers are looking at in particular. And this is the six complete cycles of breath per minute. So can you speak to that and what, what the significance of that is? Well, uh, there's, there's some really good research out there, but there's also a really good book, um, The Oxygen Advan Advantage by Patrick McEwen. And uh, he's got a lot of good videos and everybody should be picking up on what he's doing because it's astounding, especially with regard to COVID. So you, at, at a high level, you, you wanna match your breathing volume with the metabolic requirements for homeostasis and optimal oxygen saturation with minimal energy expenditure. So there's, there's this belief that the more oxygen we, we breathe, the more oxygen is delivered to the cells, but oxygen transfer from the tissues to the blood takes place due to the presence of CO2, which is kind of, which is kind of uh, counterintuitive. Studies show that athletic ability to perform during increased carbon dioxide and reduced oxygen pressure corresponds to maximal oxygen uptake. So in other words, the ability to tolerate higher concentrations of carbon dioxide in the blood means better delivery and utilization of, of oxygen by uh, the working muscles. So tolerance for CO2 enables an ability to more calmly breathe during rest and lighter breathing during physical exercise. So higher levels of performance and oxygen saturation are associated with the ability to tolerate more CO2, which in turn can be achieved through training using nose breathing instead of breathing through the mouth when you would normally be feeling the need to breathe through your mouth. So over time and during exercise, you generate a homeostatic capacity and resilience and homeostatic capacity means getting back to balance, uh, homeostatic balance as quickly as possible. Now, recognize that in medical textbooks, breathing isn't mentioned as a function of the mouth. Only the nose is listed in the function of breathing. So mouth breathing activates the upper chest and results in non-optimal breathing and can contribute to a host of medical conditions. Nose breathing, on the other hand, increases nitric oxide concentration, which enhances oxygen uptake in the blood. Nitric oxide released into the nasal cavity sterilizes the incoming air and it's the body's first line of defense against viruses. Breathing through the nose activates the diaphragm and the parasympathetic nervous system. So slower and lighter breathing brings your body into a state of relaxation. That's, that's really the whole story right there. But we've been programmed as humans. I mean, and, and so much of our actions here in the 21st century are triggered by epigenetic memories that go back 20,000 years. And people think, how could that be? We're, we're so far beyond that, but we're not. Our, our, our system is designed for survival. And those survival responses are so deep and powerful. So in a primitive state, you would open your mouth and scream and, and yell for protection or yell out of fear. And that opening mouth breathing became the, the, the response for being triggered in a, in a stressful situation. Sadly, 
we're kind of still doing that, right? So the reason we are in the Qigong Institute here and we're bringing out all this research is to help people remember there are practices that can repattern and recondition us on a deep level. That means creating new neural pathways, new behaviors, new ways to breathe. And like Tom said, you know, the simple thing of remembering that breathing through the nasal passages is going to increase your nitrous oxide in the respiratory system. It's it's already there for antiseptic reasons. It's it's there for moisturizing your breath and your air coming in. There's lots of good sense to it, but breathing is a curious thing because everybody feels like they're an expert at it because we're all alive. But look at the mess we are in. Look at the interest now in breathing, whether it's the yogic type of breathing or different people coming out with athletic type of breathing techniques. There's research now, there's massive research people need to look at to understand what is involved in the science so you can have the confidence to practice Qigong and understand that there's a tremendous resilience factor you can increase in your life. Thanks for saying so my segue there, uh, Francesco, is that you really hit the nail on the head that this is really in, almost invisible. People can't tell, you know, the, the, that they are not breathing, say, correctly. Um, but it's not about correct. It's really about relaxed. And Tom alluded to that when we talked about when he talked about the slow, deep breath, which is not a hurried breath, which is not a, a forced breath. It's really important to think about it that way that, you know, when we're doing things that we love and, it, you know, we do this spontaneous nose breathing, you know, like say when we're reading something, we're, we're really uh, engrossed in something, that's really what happens. And uh, I wanted to share this, this article here from the Journal of Clinical Medicine, and it's called The Influence of a 30-Day Slow-Paced Breathing Intervention Compared to social media use. So this is, we, we know about this. So we, we know about social media use uh, and, and how that, that, that can you know, affect our quality of sleep. And in this article, look at the, to finish the title here, the influence of a 30 day slow paced breathing intervention compared to social media use on subject, subjective sleep quality and cardiac vagal activity. So this is where, whoa, it's really, talking about just what you mentioned, how our breathing has a direct effect on the activity of our heart. And so in this 30 day study, uh, the, the uh, cardiac activity of several people or participants of uh, 64 people were measured and then uh, compared with their sleep quality the night before and then the morning after. And sure enough, 15 minutes of breathing exercise really makes a difference, especially that repeated difference uh, that, that you do over 30 days. So that little practice, that little every day, every night, coming to rest, coming to that slow, deep breathing suddenly has an effect over 30 days and has this ability to stay there. So it's that slow paced breathing technique and we were talking about that earlier. Again, in this study, six complete breath cycles per minute is what was practiced by these people. And then, and then measured through questionnaires and then through the, um, the ECG readings, the electrocardiogram readings. And so this, uh, this was really an amazing article to read because it really confirms a lot of what you were saying, Francesco, and a lot of the things that uh, Tom, you were saying as well. So I'm really thrilled about that. And did you have anything else to add uh, to this, Francesco, to this discussion? Well, I, I think if people understand their Qigong practice, and, and that's our audience here, we're talking to people who are researchers and practitioners, clinicians, and people just interested in Qigong. Do your practice, but be mindful about the moves, right? The idea is that when your moves are going slow enough and your extent of a stretch, for instance, is slow enough, what'll happen is you'll start to notice that you're breathing at six full cycles a minute. 
It's curious. It's it, when you slow down enough, and I'm not consciously saying I want to slow down. You're basically moving into synchrony, into harmony of movement and breath. And when that's a deep, vagal, stimulating diaphragmatic squeeze, and you're doing a stretch either up or down or out, watch it and time it. You'll be very close to five to seven seconds, and that's the key. So don't think of it in your intellectual mind and, and say, I've, I've got to get my clock and I've got to get a clock out on my phone and observe it because now you're triggering a whole bunch of other things in your intellectual mind we don't need to do. This is about interoception, which we've talked about in other Qigong Today shows and we will more in the future. It's Tom's favorite area, which is great because it means that you're listening to your body and your body's response. And, and this is the key of Qigong practice. When you listen, when you move in a synchronous way, you'll fall right in line with this research is showing. So I, I think that's, that's probably the most important thing to keep dropping in here is that there is a real world application and we know it intuitively. Our task here at Qigong Today at the Qigong Institute is to provide enough information, really grounding science to say, stay with it, stay confident. So this, this paper by, by Noble, uh, pulmonary efferent activity patterns during slow, deep breathing contribute to neural induction of physiological re relaxation. It sounds like a lot of big words, but I mean, afferent activity patterns uh, during slow, deep breathing means that your, your body's trying to tell you something. And it turns out that um, of the activity going on in your nervous system, 80% of it is going from your organs to your brain and not the other way around. Um, and that's something that uh, people don't really tend to understand well enough that the main activity is coming from the body. So paying attention to what your body's trying to tell you is a really big deal. Um, and controlling your respiration, um, you can see from this paper, uh, slowing Slowing your breathing as a relaxation technique has uh, shown a lot of, of promise for cardiorespiratory and stress-related disorders. And what do they and what do they say you're supposed to breathe at? Six breaths per minute. It promotes uh, behavioral relaxation, and uh, a breathing around this frequency helps with a lot of uh, helps. You can see to optimize your physiological function. So there's a tremendous amount of information that says that slow deep breathing through Qigong, which has been going on for thousands of years is a great idea. And here's the proof for it. So uh, it's saying that uh, so the slow deep breathing is actually affecting your autonomic activity. And people have thought, well, I can't affect my autonomic activity, but it turns out the one way that you can affect your autonomic activities through breathing. And Qigong has showed us that through breathing, you can slow down your heart rate and you can start to get yourself into a relaxation condition. And this affects all kinds of, of medical conditions and is the best way to practice uh, Qigong. You know, that article that you have on, online is really talking a lot about the neuroscience. Uh, and in particular, you know, we talked about nasal breathing and how that has an effect on the cognitive side of like, what are you going to be thinking about and what are you going to be reacting to? Uh, and this article really points to that and how our nasal breathing, and you, should, you know, think about it, very short distance from the nose to the brain. You know, so this is really about how this nasal breathing really affects your brain activity and your brain activity, remember, is not just about thinking, you know, thinking is there for sure, but it's also about that regulating your systems, making sure there's enough energy for everything, making sure there's enough uh, balance. And that's back to what you were saying, Tom, about homeostasis, back to what you were saying, Francesco, about you know, really finding that quality in, in your own experience that feels harmonious, that feels good, that feels 
uh, that way. And nasal breathing has that ability to start to really invite all your brain to come in to use the word synchrony. And synchrony is in the article as well. It's your brain synchronized, your brain humming really happy. And if your brain's happy, that means your body's happy because we forget that the brain is part of the body. <laughs> the brain is taking care of the body. So, you know, I, this is a great article. I'm really glad you, um, you curated this one, Tom. And it's interesting that you mentioned humming because it turns out that humming is an incredible way to uh, improve your health. And we know in Qigong, there's, uh, there's healing sounds. And healing sounds uh, involve physical exercise. Usually the practices of, phys- of, of healing sounds involves not just the sound, but, but moving around a bit. But uh, the, main, the main focus is, is the healing sound. And it turns out the research has shown that the healing sounds actually affect the vagus nerve. So, uh, and the vagus nerve is tied to the autonomic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system in particular. And that is a relaxation response. So the, the humming also affects the amount of nitric oxide that, that you have in uh, your nasal cavities. And we, we mentioned earlier about all the benefits from that. So the benefits from, from the healing sounds is twofold really, because it affects the parasympathetic nervous system through uh, the vagus nerve, but it also affects the amount of nitric oxide. And that's really important. And healing sounds has been uh, <clears throat> put forward as um, different sounds for different organs. Uh, the research hasn't gotten to the point where it says that uh, particular organs vibrate <clears throat> at any particular frequencies, but it, it turns out that research probably hasn't just been done yet because if you think about it, every molecule in your body is vibrating. So it makes perfect sense that, that every organ in your body is vibrating too. It's just that, is there a specific frequency? Well, maybe, maybe not. But it turns out that for sure the research shows that humming has an amazing effect by, <clears throat> by affecting your, uh, the amount of nitric oxide. So that's, uh, that's a double whammy for, for healing sounds through <laughs> the vagus nerve and through uh, increase in nitric oxide. That's great, Tom. You know, I, I've studied various healing sounds in China from different masters, probably four different styles. I, you know, I, I was surprised to see that there was four distinct different healing sound frequencies from four different schools of thought. So it made me start to question about just what you brought up here. What I found was consistent, though, was making that sound, even though it may have been a different sound for the liver in one system than another than another, the exhales were about five or six seconds long. The inhales were about five or six seconds long. And guess what? Just like drinking green tea is proven that probably it's the water intake that much more hydration than the actual green tea itself effect, although it does have an effect. The breathing and the healing sounds dropping you into six full breath cycles or so a minute may be more important in the long run. Now, yes, I'm all for quantum vibrations and understanding that our, our chromatins vibrate at a certain coherent level, that once we get that and good research from people like Garyev and Russia have shown that we can vibrate at certain levels for healing. But I think that's complex for the average person. But the breath, like we're trying to bring out today, is being shown once again that even through healing sounds, it may be more important to have deeper vagus nerve stimulating breathing at a cycle that's more in harmony for the body to all of a sudden generate a tremendous effect of bringing our body into homeostasis. Wouldn't you say the research is from many different directions is kind of pointing back to this, you guys? Oh, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> but also you have to realize that with the, the humming, is the nitric oxide part. And that's separate from the benefits of the vagus. So you've got, again, it's a double whammy there. But also the research is showing, keep your mouth closed while you're doing it. 
So that, that's a little discontinuous with, I think, people saying uh, with the healing sounds where you, you actually make the sound through your mouth. But those are exhales. The right. inhales are always nasal inhales. And if I do a sound out of my nose and mouth, some of the sounds like Wong Ar Hung, a Tibetan healing sound technique, really puts focus on the first two Wong and R in the nasal passages. Mm -hmm. So these are 1500 year old techniques before we could ever check on blood oxygen levels, blood carbon dioxide levels. Intuitively, we know. And I hope that through all this research that we're sharing, people can really trigger their intuitive understandings and say, wow, you know, this, this research is great. It triggers my intellect. It makes good scientific sense. But there's something intuitive that's getting triggered inside the, me that makes sense on a physiological level. So that's, I, I guess, what the three of us would agree to that, don't you think? That is where our goal here is? Absolutely. You know, to talk about the fundamentals that are part of practice, that are part of uh, contemplative practice, that are part of that drawing your attention away from the, the, the distractions and just noticing what's, what's there. You know, that's absolutely crucial here. And then, you know, something happens when we do that. Something happens to change our physiology just in that moment. And it's that go slow enough uh, and, and to relax enough that a change happens that's very noticeable. It's very significant. And so we've, we've shown <clears throat> through all we've been talking about today about how uh, resilience, which is what, what we're concerned about, is, is enhanced through Qigong uh, slow paced breathing. Well, I think we've covered a lot of issues here. Do you want to bring anything else up, you guys, or you feel like we've, we've wrapped it good? Oh, uh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> we wrapped it. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's, a lot, there's a lot of information here. And, and I want to remind you, know, you, if you're watching this video, to go to the qigonginstitute.org website, because Tom, who's the president, has now put the database link right on the home page. So I'm super happy. So I just have to go to qigonginstitute.org. Right on the home page is a single click link to get you into the database. And as you saw from Josie's work, she types in words like protective, protection. We can use different words and you'd be amazed at what comes up. So I invite you all to go to that website. It's free, great information. Tom's done a dynamite job on bringing lots of research together. And stay tuned for our next Qigong Today episode where we'll cover other interesting topics to help you with your practice of Qigong.